Good afternoon. It's two o'clock. I'm calling to order this meeting uh, uh, regarding our growth plan. And this is for our growth plan only. Um, this is for the purpose of education and processing the outcome of Knox planning. Again, just the growth plan. There will be no public forum at this meeting. However, we welcome the fact that uh, citizens and press are here alike. Um, the format that we're going to use on this is we're going to be hearing from the mayor, from Jim Snowden, from Amy Brooks, and perhaps a couple of other folks. If you all would please hold your questions until all the um, presenters have finished. I'm uh, anticipating many of our questions will be answered after we hear them. And then after that, I'll open the floor to take our own questions. Commissioners, please be sure to that you have the back of your microphones um, plugged in so that we're ready to go. And having said that, Mr. Mayor, we're going to open the meeting with your remarks. You're not a good listener. <laughs> it takes a second to cycle. Okay, I think there we go. Thank you for your patience. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today and to hear more about the growth policy plan and amendments. As you're aware, the growth policy process is somewhat complicated. A little history of how we got here. After an attempt to amend the plan in 2019, we listened to feedback and began the process of creating our first comprehensive land use and transportation plan. Reconvening the Growth Policy Committee was the next step. I proposed an amendment based on the data gathered from the comprehensive plan, as well as input from the public and various stakeholders. The committee reconvened in October of last year and held its final meeting in January. In all, there were four public meetings at which many of you were in attendance. We heard from residents, as well as members of this body, requesting additional changes to the proposal. We carefully we considered each request, made some edits, and presented a final amendment, which was approved at the Growth Policy Coordinating Committee meeting on January 10th. <clears throat> there are members from the leadership team here to give a presentation and answer any questions you might have regarding the plan and the amendments. I realize that land use decisions are always contentious and that no plan is going to be perfect. Nevertheless, I'm convinced that our proposal does provide the best option for the continued well-being of Knox County and our people. I ask for your, excuse me, I ask for your support and help in moving this plan forward. And as always, thank you for your service to Knox County. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stoden, I believe you're next to be speaking to the group. Actually, uh, Ms. Brooks will take that and then All I'll right. follow up. Certainly, certainly. Yes. Good Ms. afternoon, Brooks. everyone. We want to start out by talking to you about the relationship of, of all these different plans that we have here in the county. So we want to start off by talking about the growth policy plan and what it does and doesn't do. And put it into context with the other tools that we as an agency in Knox County have to consider land use and future growth and development. So I'm going to talk about where we are right now and the purpose of this meeting, which is the growth policy plan. This is one of the three documents that we'll touch on here briefly at the beginning of the presentation. And I'm gonna talk about the purpose of the plan and which is to establish three areas, the urban growth, the plan growth, and the rural area. Of all the documents um, that I'll go over, this one is the most general. And reading this map does not tell us that everything shown in yellow is going to be suburban residential neighborhood, or that every parcel in the rural area is a farm. What it does tell us is that the areas in yellow, yellow have been identified as places that future growth
I want to take a minute to emphasize some things that this plan does not do. It is not a rezoning of someone's property. It does not dictate development, but like I said just a moment ago, it does identify places that future growth could go in the years to come. It doesn't make someone use their property differently or make them sell their property. If someone is farming on their property right now, this process does not change that. Next slide. So now I wanna to touch on the comprehensive plan. The purpose of this plan is to provide recommendations for land use and transportation. It outlines policies and guidance on how the county can guide future growth. The creation of this plan is really how we got started with all this, as the mayor mentioned. The advanced Knox process has taken place over the last two plus years and involved a thorough analysis of where and how the county could accommodate growth. And we've received input from thousands of community members through this process. This helps us go from the general question of where could growth be accommodated that we are answering through the growth policy plan to what types of uses are appropriate in these different areas. <laughs> This is the point where we can begin to understand where and what scale residential development might occur or where a commercial center might be more appropriate. And it's important to note that there are places with rural character found throughout our county. Again, when you look at this map, you're able to see much more nuance and can identify what places, even those within the planned growth area that are anticipated to remain more rural in character and which areas are more appropriate for that traditional suburban style <laughs> development and where we might see more intense areas, more intense uses. Those are the things you can't determine by looking at the growth policy plan map, but can begin to understand with a comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. So I just wanna emphasize that the comprehensive plan map, which we refer to as the future land use map or flume, was created first with all the input that I mentioned over the last two years, and we then began, uh, we took those uh, growth policy boundaries and brought them into alignment with this map. Next slide, please. And finally, we have our zoning ordinance and map. This document takes the recommendations from the comprehensive plan and defines what is illegally allowed at the parcel level. It is the most detailed defined tool that we have but I want to be clear that we are talking about right now is not the zoning code. We in the county know that this document will have to be updated to help us implement the comprehensive plan if it's, if it's adopted. Um, we know that both the separation and coordination among these three documents can be confusing, um, but it's really important to note that they are all closely linked and build upon each other. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Director Snowden, who's going to review um, the proposed amendments to the growth policy plan. All right, and before you do, Amy, if you would just in one sentence, please define the growth policy plan and and the, the next one in the zoning. Just a one, just a one sentence definition so that everyone up here understands the language we're speaking. So the growth policy plan establishes boundaries for rural plan growth and urban growth areas. And you want me to define the- And then the comprehensive <clears throat> plan? The comprehensive plan provides recommendations for land use and transportation policies and action steps to guide future growth and economic prosperity and quality of life. And these recommendations in the comprehensive plan are presented by planning to commission? They will be, in terms of the, the, the draft comprehensive plan that we've been working on mm -hmm. with the county, it'll be presented by the county and planning staff. All right, thank you. And then the ends with the zoning. The zoning regulates land uses recommended in the comprehensive plan by defining what is legally allowed on a specific parcel. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Mr. Snowden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I will go through the text amendments uh, as well as the amendments to the map uh, that were approved by the, the growth policy committee uh, that you all will be considering later this month. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, the first text amendment is really just adding some specificity to the, um, the rezonings on slopes. Uh, in the current plan that was adopted in 2000, it only identified certain zones that those uh, slope requirements were to be met. Uh, this plan uh, indicates that rezonings of slopes shall be placed on the, by the, on the adopted policies of each body. Uh, so that's a little more specific than the, than the previous plan. Next slide, please. Um, once again, a little bit more specifics there on this one. Uh, you have uh, three handouts uh, in your packet there that uh, 
denote rural crossroads, rural conservation, and rural living. Uh, those are the only place types that will be allowed uh, for Amy staff's consideration as part of uh, the uh, the new growth policy plan. Uh, previously, it did allow ag, estate, open space, floodway, and PR. Uh, so once again, a little more specifics there. Next slide, please. Uh, a lot of words here. Uh, so this is something that we revised in the previous growth policy plan to allow for additional restrictions in the rural area, uh, to allow for um, the better alignment of growth and infrastructure. Uh, the, uh, the, won't read it verbatim, but essentially it talks to, in the, in the current growth policy plan, you can have up to three dwelling units an acre in the rural area. Uh, in this proposal, you're only allowed two dwelling units per acre. Uh, within that two dwelling units an acre, you, you are required to have a sanitary sewer system uh, or an, a system, a private system approved by the public utility that would ultimately maintain that. And then the, uh, there is language in this one regarding the width of the road that you would join. Uh, the old plan did not codify that. Uh, this one speaks to that you must have a collector roadway uh, as defined by the uh, major road plan of Knox County that's adopted by this body uh, of uh, 18 feet or greater in width. Uh, so th th those are some additional things that we wanted to add in to allow for the protection of those rural areas. Uh, next slide, please. Um, th this, this particular issue, it, it talks about as the effective day of this plan, all previously approved densities in rural areas shall remain in effect. Essentially what's that saying is you are grandfathered in and zoning. If you have a PR zone at three dwelling units an acre and you're in the current uh, or the proposed rural area, uh, you will retain that three dwelling units an acre and not go back to the two that we just previously talked about. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the uh, summary of the text amendments. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, the map amendments. Uh, in this particular map is is the total of the expanded areas. We had a total of five areas that we expanded. Uh, the percentage uh, of plan growth expansion was seven percent. Uh, so uh, from the 2000 map to the map that you're looking at today, that is a seven percent increase in area of PGA expansion. Um, we'll, we'll talk about three of the large areas that we expanded. There were two small areas that uh, were so minor that we don't have a particular slide for. We can get you that information. Those were at uh, Straw Plains and then uh, at Oak Ridge Highway in, uh, in the Carnes community, but they were very small. Um, these three particular expansions, uh, one is on Chapman Highway uh, near the Bower Field community. Uh, obviously, Chapman Highway is a major state highway that is undergoing substantial improvements right now. Uh, so in addition to that, uh, there was some uh, utility infrastructure in place. Uh, so this map reflects the expansion of the roadway and the sewer and water infrastructure uh, to align those growth policies. Next slide, please. The, uh, this shows the expansion in the Hardin Valley community. If you'll notice, it runs uh, parallel with Hardin Valley Road uh, and then goes off of, off, you know, buffers off of that. It doesn't go much, you know, down to the lake where those infrastructures are not adequate, uh, both from sewer and water and roadways, but it does stay parallel to that corridor. Uh, we have several projects uh, that are in place here, uh, expansion of Everett Road. Uh, we are working on uh, getting a design contract for the expansion of Hardin Valley Road. Uh, so once again, just trying to align that uh, transportation infrastructure uh, with, the, um, with the expansion of the PGA. Next slide, please. Uh, the last area is uh, in, the, in the Rita community. Uh, as you can see, we expanded up to almost McGinnis Road, uh, kind of starting at a little bit past Burkhart to McGinnis. Uh, this area of expansion, obviously there's uh, several road projects, one in the city, a couple in the county, uh, that uh, we're going to use to support this. We actually have 
a uh, request for qualifications that we're going to do to bring on a subconsultant to do much like we did the Hardin Valley transportation study a few years ago. We're going to do a uh, Gibbs transportation study. Uh, unfortunately, in Hardin Valley, we did it after a lot of the growth occurred. We're going to do this one before that growth does occur so that we can be proactive in that and ultimately assign projects that would serve this community and this growth uh, in the next 20 years. Uh, next steps, uh, the uh, growth policy uh, amendments have to be approved by all three legislative bodies in the county. Uh, the county commission, this body, will uh, consider these on February the 26th, and we do have uh, meetings uh, scheduled with city council on March the 5th and one on March the 28th with the town of Farragut Board of Aldermen. Uh, so it is our hope to have uh, the, uh, the plan and text amendments approved by the end of March. And last slide is uh, just how the uh, Tammy, when, when she spoke about the, the flume, the future land use map, uh, that uh, process, we did, we did have a meeting with the Planning Commission last week. Uh, it was originally on the agenda for February. We received some comments. We wanted to digest those a little more. So we did uh, defer 30 days. Uh, so the, uh, the flume will be considered by Planning Commission in March. Uh, we will then obviously need to meet with you guys and go over the specifics and any questions you may have. And then we hope to have uh, the future land use map in, for your all's bodies for, for consideration in April. Uh, so with that, be happy to entertain any questions or uh, comments you may have. Is there anyone else that's going to be speaking directly to this before I open the floor? Ms. Brooks, Ms. no, all right, thank you. All right, that was a, ex that was a really excellent, um, concise summary of exactly um, what, what we're dealing with at this point in time. Having said that, I will go ahead and open the floor to um, questions and comments. Ms. Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, First, I want to thank this administration and the leadership team. You all have really put in the work. I mean, I've seen a genuine commitment to the process and approving our, our approach to land use, um, decision making, and also planning for supportive infrastructure. So thank you for that. You know, over the course of the process of the last two years, I have been in constant communication with um, leadership members, um, my policy advisor, advocacy groups, and community members. Um, and I know this has not been an easy undertaking at all, especially when the priority outcomes of all the data and collection and public input was one, preservation and conservation of our rural character and hillside and ridge tops, two, coordinating infrastructure with development, and three, more housing options. So finding balance between those, um, it's a tremendous challenge. And I know you all have worked really hard to do that, so thank you. I also want to thank the thousands of citizens who came out um, for the Advanced Knox meetings, and they continue to be a part of this very important process. I think it's important to remind everyone that we work for you, and we know that your land is your most valuable asset. And as a county, we've got to treat it that way. So, of course, we want to be welcoming to newcomers, um, but our focus really does need to be on the half a million citizens who've already paid into our tax base and have felt the squeeze of unintentional growth. I wanna make sure we do that and I'm, I'm committing to ensuring that our land use processes that we put into place strengthen and elevate our standards. You know, we've got a lot of work to do but it does start with this growth policy plan. So with all that said, I do have a series of questions um, about the process and several of my questions do relate to the comprehensive plan and the future Unified Development Ordinance, um, it's, those are all critical pieces of the bigger picture, so it's hard to discuss one without mentioning or asking questions about the other. Um, also, I'm hoping that we will have a similar workshop on the comprehensive plan like you all presented to Planning Commission. I attended that and it was really well done and super informative, so well done on that and thank you for that. Um, I'm tr I'll try not to get into the weeds too much, but that's kind of where I'm most comfortable 
as my colleagues are, I think, learning. Um, so I do ask you to bear with me and your patience as I kind of work through these questions. And some of them are quite elementary, but I really want the public to have a good understanding of the steps in the process and how and where we will address many of the questions and concerns that they put forward. So um, starting with that, if you'll just briefly give us the state legislation regarding land use and kind of how the growth policy plan was created. I can start now. I would welcome others to jump in. So public chapter 1101, it's called the Growth Policy Act. It requires comprehensive it requires a comprehensive growth policy plan in each county in the state and outlines anticipated development for areas over a 20 year period. Thank you, Amy. Um, now, will you just summarize quickly each body's scope of authority for the growth policy plan? And I mean, the coordinating committee, county commission, the town of Farragut and the city. So I can give you a little bit of but, so the coordinating committee, um, maybe I'm, I'm going to step back a little bit. Um, so the the growth, the Knox County Growth Policy Coordinating Committee was originally formed in 1998 in response to this legislation, um, Public Chapter 1101, um, to prepare that local growth plan for Knoxville, Knox County, Town of Farragut. Um, the plan was adopted in 2001, and pages one through five of the current growth policy plan outline. Um, the provide background on how that plan was developed. Um, the charter itself um, addresses zoning, but I'm, I think that was another question, um, mm -hmm. Commissioner, that you had, but it doesn't specifically speak to this plan. Okay. So, so once the coordinating committee reviews an amendment, um, it goes to this body, um, as was laid out in sort of these, these steps mm -hmm. here, but also city council, Knoxville city council, as well as the town of Farragut as well have to vote on that. Okay. Amendment. Thank you for going over that. Um, and you talked a little bit about the difference between the growth map and the future land use map. Can you just clarify that which of those will be a policy map or codified and which will not? And if one is not, is there the potential to codify that map as well? If you could maybe specify what you mean by codified. Well, the growth map is a policy map. Mm -hmm. um, and then as it stands now, the future land use map is advisory. So if county commission adopts either plan, okay. it becomes operative. Okay. So it means that, you know, future decisions regarding land use must comply with those plans. So you're saying that the flume will have a scope of authority. If it's adopted by it's county adopted. commission. Yes, and okay. I don't know if Great. your that, attorney would like to land on that. That clarifies perfectly, thank you. Um, can you go over kind of the criteria that was used to determine the proposed um, amendments of the growth map? Like for instance, did you look at the availability of sewer and environmental constraints? What other factors were um, considered, farmland, soil? Um, and just kind of talk about how you were able to um, designate the plan growth areas, rural areas, and urban areas, please. Yeah. I, I'll jump in a little bit there, Commissioner Frazier. I, I, I kind of spoke a little bit of that, and I, I probably was remiss. I should have got a little more into it. Uh, we had several committees as part of this. Some of those obviously were schools and utilities. So we wanted to, um, you know, align the capacity of schools, capacity of roadway infrastructure, as well as capacity of utilities to uh, locations that didn't put a burden on those entities. Uh, so we actually went back and revisited that uh, with the utility providers really within the last month just to verify that. So uh, from an infrastructure perspective, that's what, I guess was my role uh, in in the selection of those others. Yeah. Just to add a little bit more context, um, this this whole process started with advance knocks, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure all of you remember we've sat down and spoken to you several times about um, the advance knocks knocks process. Um, one of the things that we did through that advance knocks process was do scenario planning. Um, the scenario planning looked at um, the underlying characteristics of the places within Knox County and uh, determined how much capacity they could hold and whether they were suitable for basically would development want to go 
and and site itself mm -hmm. um, and those locations. And once we had done all of that, we kind of backfilled um, the areas of the growth policy boundary. So once we'd looked at a very comprehensive analysis of um, where growth could occur in the entire county, we uh, then drew around um, the borders of place types which were um, suitable for a planned growth location versus a rural location. So when you think about how these growth policy boundaries were determined, they were they built upon the work that we did in the comprehensive plan. So it wasn't a separate process. This is basically a product of that larger two-year process where we spoke to people, had our subcommittees, spoke to the technical advisory committee, the public advisory committee, um, and this is the result of that. Thank you, Kathy. And excuse me, um, for the record, would you identify yourself? Catherine Olson, Engineering and Public Works. Thank you, Catherine. And then how and where will we connect adding more land to the planned growth area to more affordable housing? Um, I think it's important for the public to understand that decision makers, we can't consider price points during our deliberation. So what legislative policies can the county put into place that will ensure more housing options in the planned growth area? Do you want, or you want to jump in? No, no. I can start off. So none of our current policies or these plans can determine the affordability of a specific development. That's not something that's within our purview. Um, there could be policies and programs that are put into place by the local jurisdiction that could incentivize affordability, but that's, that's not something that we control with the plans that we have currently. Is that something that we can look at through the place types and also our unified development ordinance as far as um, some of the standards and requirements? I don't think you could, you, you couldn't utilize place types um, to determine affordability. Again, that is a land use tool. Mm -hmm. um, there are some, I don't think either, even in your zoning code, you could um, put policies into place in that particular ordinance that would require something to be of a certain uh, level of affordability or to prevent something to be a certain level of affordability. Um, there are other tools in place that could be explored um, by the county over the next, you know, several years. Um, but I wouldn't say that's something that we'd want to use one of these tools for. Okay. And then there were some questions from citizens and advocacy groups about the population projections that were used. Do y'all care to just speak to that really quickly? Terry Kahula is with our research staff. So with the comprehensive plan portion of this work, uh, the population projections were derived from the 2045 mobility plan, which is the long range transportation plan that was adopted by Knoxville, Knox County and the surrounding area back in 2021. Um, because the comprehensive plan work from Advanced Knox is both a land use and transportation plan, we wanted to make sure that the two plans, these two major long range plans for our community were gonna be in alignment. So um, the population projection models that were developed from the mobility plan were current at the time of the start of the work of the Advanced Knox work. So um, it just made great sense to mm -hmm. take that work and apply it directly into the comp plan. Thank you, Terry, for yep. clarifying that. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, I also understand that the current plan growth areas were not considered for other uses. So for instance, we have land in the current plan growth areas that have long been working farms, century farms, or are in conservation easements, but those parcels could not be considered as rural areas. And I was just curious as to why. And I asked that because we regularly monthly actually consider changing rural areas to planned residential. So what was the thinking about that, basically not pulling back any of the existing planned growth areas? Yeah, and, and that's a good question, Commissioner Fraser. One of the things that we looked at with that was from a policy level decision, the mayor 
didn't want to roll back any of that PGA with some of those areas where there may be some, you know, uh, century farms and other, you know, very, very important farms in the community, really just due to the property rights associated with that. That was some of the things we talked to uh, the law director's office about. And we just had some concerns about the, the property rights uh, diminishing with those parcels. Can I add one extra thing in here is um, on a monthly basis, I don't believe you guys are changing the growth policy designation from rural to anything else. That's not what's happening. And I think there is a little bit of confusion because in the growth policy um, designations, you have a rural area. And then in the land use classifications or our place types, you have rural areas, you have rural living and rural conservation. And then in zoning, you have agricultural land. Those are three very similarly titled, very similarly used um, designations, but they're not the same. So we, you guys, none of the planned growth designations, urban, um, urban growth, planned growth or rural, have been changed since 2000, with the exception of the urban growth boundary, which has, um, which changed because City of Knoxville expanded. So they absorbed some of that urban growth area into their um, corporate limits. So there was a little bit of a change there when it came to the city of Knoxville boundaries, but the rural area has not changed since 2000. Um, so I just wanted to make that very clear that when you are changing, you're making sector plan amendments to the sector plans or you're making rezoning changes, but not to the growth policy plan. Thank you, Kathy, for that clarification. That was great. Um, uh, and I also too wanna thank the leadership team and also the mayor because one of the the amendments that came before the coordinating committee was they were allowing rural place types in the planned growth areas that was not originally the case and so i want to thank you all for really hearing the public and the citizens and and making that change that that was that was a great change in my opinion and um, i know that there have been some residents who are in current or proposed planned growth areas that do have conservation easements or legacy farms that perhaps may have submitted a letter asking to be excluded from the plant growth area. Is that going to be considered? And if so, how? And then how will the county then respond to them? Anyone? <laughs> I can speak to that, Commissioner Fraser. Yes. Um, we, obviously we just said we're not going to roll back mm -hmm. any of the planned growth area, but we will look at those parcels um, a little bit closer when we look at that future land use map and potentially use those rural place types in those areas. Okay, thank you, Mandy. Um, and Mandy, if you, for the record. Oh, yep. Mandy Benedict, the mayor's office. Thank you. And what will protections look like in the place types and land use classifications for natural areas, open space, and forests located in the plant growth areas? I can attempt to answer that one. So there are several rural place types that support, um, so there's rural conservation, there's rural living, and you know, rural conservation supports cluster development, and that specifically was identified as a place type that would be beneficial in this county because it can preserve significant um, areas with environmental constraints. Um, open space is also a place type that can be applied to large areas and um, that are either publicly held or not expected to change through the plan's horizon. Um, so does that answer your yeah, question? It does, thank okay. you. Yes. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out, especially to the public, is that there are many areas in the proposed plan growth areas that have either current, completed, or approved construction of development projects, especially in the 6th District. Much of the expanded plan growth area, we've already got subdivisions there. Um, so I really wanted to just to publicly put that out there that it's important to look at what is under construction? Where have we expanded utilities? But this map had not been updated. So there are, there are quite a few. And I think there's been some confusion with that. So I just wanted to put that out there. And also, I wanted to point out too, because there was a question about plan growth area in the North Shore Chodo areas. It's my understanding there was no change to the plan growth area in that area, correct? Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see. 
What's the plan for future review and amendments to the growth map? I'm not aware of any, any plans after this. Um, okay. What are the recommended, like what is a, a good kind of standard practice or best practice for reviewing a growth map? Five years, three um, years, I think the, le years? the legislation said it, it needed to stay into place. The original legislation that was, um, that was passed at the state level, five years. Okay. Um, but I would say, you know, I've, I've not consulted with all um, jurisdictions who have a growth policy plan um, to see how often they have those updated. But in terms of the legislation itself, every five years. But I think it's really dependent on the community. Okay. Thank you. And then the sector plans, they've got a, a great deal of really useful information. And I understand we're going to more small area plans, which I think is, is a, a great way to address community character and feel and specific needs and visions of a specific area. For instance, in you know, uh, Commissioner Lee's district, Halls, Powell, High School, they all have a different vision for their needs and, and really what they expect from us as a government. So I, I understand that. Is there going to be a place that, and I think you've, you've been working on this, where a list of the plans and the studies that will remain in use for future planning purposes? I know that there's one in the back of the general plan. Um, could we also include a list of those? Yes, I, I believe, Commissioner, that those have already been added great. to the draft comprehensive plan. That's great. All right, let's see. Thanks for your patience. You kind of already answered how often the amendments to um, the growth plan. What about amendments to the comprehensive plan and the future land use map? How often will those be reviewed and amended? Well, it's still a draft plan. And so, you know, the Planning Commission hasn't specifically weighed in on their recommendation, but the um, we heard some feedback last week from the Planning Commission that there was some concern about um, how frequent those amendments would take place. Currently, they can happen on a monthly basis. Um, and the proposal that will be going forward to the Planning Commission is on a quarterly basis. That would mirror what um, the city does for their plan. And is that for the first two years or is that until we review and see how things are going? I think it's until we review and see how okay. things are going, but for a minimum of three years. Okay. And then how are, how are we going to address densities um, going forward? Uh, for instance, what's the density difference between the suburban residential and suburban mixed use residential? Well, you know, as I mentioned, we have not updated the zoning code, so that would be the next step. So the zoning code is what identifies exactly what you can do on individual parcels. So we would still be bound by the current zoning code, which is um, primarily based to, with density. So if you look in the comprehensive plan, I think it's Appendix H. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, it's There's a place type categories in zoning, which uh, identifies those place types, future land use, and which zoning districts could be considered. I will say that, you know, density can be regulated in two ways. So requiring the maximum number of units per acre is one way, um, and that's what we've historically done in this county. And then there's also a way of looking at it by looking at lot and building dimensional standards. Regulating density units by acre is really a blunt instrument. It's not really going to provide you with enough information to let you know what development will actually look like on the ground. So there are some limitations to that. I think once we get to updating the zoning, code, those conversations need to happen in um, more detail. We need to have more conversation, more public input, um, and maybe some good examples of what we might want to consider going forward. So the goal of the process is really the county going from being reactive to proactive when it comes to growth and coordinating supportive infrastructure. So how will the new process ensure this? So one of the ways that um, this plan, the growth policy plan, mm -hmm. as well as the next step, the comprehensive plan, is going to help us be more proactive is a really simple one. It's that we've already identified where we think development will go. Now we don't have to chase after where development decides to go. Mm -hmm. So we can, um, we've already defined the areas that we think are attractive for development and suitable for development. 
and we can, um, for example, you know, Jim's working on a mobility study for that area of kind of Ritter, Washington, Pike, because we can anticipate that development will likely go there now. Mm -hmm. So we can look over the plan horizon year and say, okay, by 2045, we imagine that X number of, of homes will be built in this area and the roads will have to handle X, um, you know, AADT on those, on those roadways. So we can use those plans to be able to submit to federal agencies, state agencies, and get grants because they're not going to give us money if we don't have a plan for how you know things are going to look and have a good justification for the cost benefit of those investments. So that's just one very, very simple way that having a plan in place and having everybody on board helps us to be more proactive. I'm sure there are other examples my colleagues can give, but... Thank you. Now that explains it perfectly. Uh, uh, Director Snowden, what do we have an estimated cost of new and improved roads in the expanded plan growth areas? We don't have that just yet. We are still working. As a matter of fact, I was working on the capital budget request that you guys will see later this year uh, for the, uh, in addition to Everett Road, but the Watt Road. Uh, you know, obviously, very large improvement, uh, you know, including, you know, acquisition of property, design and construction. We're still working on that number, but I mean, historically our uh, annual capital budget hovers around $20 million. Uh, so over the next five years, we would anticipate to see somewhere around $100 million. And to Kathy's point, that gives us the ability now, knowing where this growth is liable to occur, to better focus that expenditure of that $100 million over the next five years. Great, thank you. And I guess the same answer is for the parks and recreational areas as well. Do that the same. And then questions about the school. I know that uh, Knox County Schools, they've been a part of the process. Um, they've seen the map, they've seen the expanded areas, they had their own subcommittee. I did reach out to Dr. Ryswick and Garfield Adams and they said that they look at student populations annually as a part of their capital plan. And that includes conducting five-year student enrollment projections with Knoxville Knox County Planning. Um, Advanced Knox kind of showed us that um, what the county would look like in 20 years and the schools have historically kept their focus to be intentionally far shorter because they don't want to be in a position of requesting the expenditure of public funds to construct schools based on a projection that might fall short. Um, in my opinion, the only way to do that is for our schools to be a stronger focus in the planning process. And I think that was actually identified as one of the top three concerns and requests from all the data collected that folks want to see a more coordinated effort between land use processes and school improvements or new construction. So I'm hoping and I would like to see a stronger component in the comprehensive plan that does focus on managing impact on the schools as a resor result of development. I didn't hear much discussion uh, about this from Knox County Schools at the coordinating committee meeting, and I just wanted to make sure that school impact is a priority. Is that something that we can we can do in the comp plan? Sure. I, I actually, I was in a meeting with Garfield uh, last week, and we talked again about it, and we want to set up meetings quarterly to where we discuss those things and make sure that our improvements are in line with theirs. And Director Snowden, talk a little bit about the UDO and how it will differ from current zoning ordinances and will it strengthen our approach to land use and decision making? And then also, will it include any cost sharing agreements, possibly for road improvements? And will that be something that commission will, um, will be able to help create through an ordinance so that we have just a standard kind of cost sharing agreement and then you would execute those? Sure, be glad to. And, and you're exactly right. The UDO is going to do, uh, our ordinance now, as you all know, is very old. And on a daily basis, we're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. So, uh, we that you know, in addition just to the practical uh, implications and improvements of the ordinance, we one of the things we do want to do is assign, uh, you know, minimum road standards uh, based on the classification so that when developers come in, that we can work with them and make sure that those roadways that they're adjoining or that they tend to adjoin uh, have a standard that's that's current and uh, reflects the needs of the community at that time. Uh, so that is something that obviously the, that UDO will include a lot of public engagement uh, as well as adoption by this body. So you guys will have a, have a large say in ultimately what that looks like as far as uh, partnerships with developers. 
Thank you. And then my last question, I know you are glad. Um, what is the process for implementing the new growth map, the land use classifications, the comp plan updates, and the UDO? Is there a, transi a transition plan that will kind of be put into place? And what does that look like? I believe the, the growth policy plan would become effective um, May 1st. Was that the date? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so, I mean, it really just depends on when um, the comprehensive plan is considered by the Planning Commission and if it's voted on by this body and if you all adopt it. Um, I think our staff at Knox & Knox County Planning would need at least 45 to 60 days in order to transition. Um, there's some things that we do uh, with our our database and how we track projects that will need to change. So um, obviously we would like to see this move forward uh, as quickly as possible. It, we think it's a really good plan and it's going to move our, our county forward. And we're anxious to get started on working on this UDO because uh, as, as Jim just mentioned, our ordinances are really dated mm -hmm. and um, yeah, they need to be better aligned. Me too. <clears throat> and I just, I want to say in, in summary really quickly, I hope that this really showcased the level of commitment and knowledge and work that the staff has done on this. I know that there's been tons of questions and concerns along the way, especially you know from, from different parts of the county. And to me, asking these questions and hearing how um, they are already thinking about things that are to come that we will have to address, um, I just... I just want to applaud you all for doing that, and thank you for bearing with me through my questions. Thank you. Um, Commissioner um, Jay? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you talked about updating that zoning code and giving us the actual practical tools to, you know, to then work with. Can you help me understand what that process might look like in the timeline? Is it going to require an outside consultant? Um, What's the general timeline and expense of that? How much does, what does that look like in a snapshot? Assuming, of course, it all goes smoothly. Well, I'll let Jim talk about the cost of it. Um, so it's going to take at least um, 18 months to two years <coughs> to update our code. As you know, as it was mentioned, the UDO is different than what we currently have. We have all these separate ordinances, and the idea behind a, a UDO is that it combines uh, these tools, the traditional zoning and subdivision regulations, as well as other um, regulations in the county into one document. Um, and so that, that's going to that's take a little bit of time. It's going to take a lot of um, collaboration internally and also a lot of input from the public. You want to talk about the cost? And, and I think on the cost, we've talked to a couple consultants and actually done one RFQ and actually uh, wasn't able to negotiate a, a, a scope and fee with a consultant. Uh, but I would anticipate low end to be 500000 high end to be $750,000 for that, uh, you know, 18-month process. Do you anticipate that being broken over potentially two years of a fiscal cycle or allocating it all in one fiscal cycle? The, the intent originally was to allocate it over over just one one cycle, uh, but uh, obviously I can talk to the finance director about that. But the thought was was to implement it over one fiscal year. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I did want to just recognize two folks in the audience tonight. Um, the vice mayor of the town of Farragut, Louise Pavlin, is present, and also one of our big fans from the Knoxville Chamber, Amy Nolan, is with us this afternoon. So good to see you. Uh, Mr. Snowden, in your presentation uh, about the rural area, you mentioned that um, the new classification will be two dwelling units per acre, but if something has already previously been zoned to three dwelling units, that those properties will remain grandfathered. So my question is, the, the, the property would be maintained at the three units an acre, but would they but now be uh, susceptible to uh, upgrading the road to 18 feet in front of their property. Would they be now required if this passes? Correct. And that would that would really apply even if this didn't pass. I mean, we, uh, you know, depending on, we look at road width very related to the number of trips or 
average daily traffic that's on there. So we have processes in place now, whether this plan approves or not, that if someone adds a certain, you know, a certain amount of traffic to the roadway that we cr we think creates, you know, unsafe or really unreasonable uh, traffic conditions, we can ask them uh, to make those improvements to 18 or even, even greater than 18, uh, depending on what the, their traffic analysis proposes. So we, we have that capability today, whether or not this plan moves forward or not. Okay, and do we have any idea how many parcels we have out there that potentially could have uh, fifty percent more dwelling units than what the new plan would have. We don't know. I don't think we've looked at that. We can take a look at that and then try to get you a little better uh, insight in that before uh, the work session and voting meeting on this. But unless someone else here under knows, I, I don't believe that we have that exact number. No, sir. Do, just do you think it's nominal or? No idea. I, okay. I would want to okay. reserve until we, but we will look at that and okay. see if we can get you a good answer on that by the end of the month. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Snowden. Commissioner Daly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank everyone that's been involved in this. It's been a great process. I got to attend quite a few of the meetings, and I know it's hard. You're not going to make everybody happy. That's part of being part of government. Jim, let's go back to... Uh, the cost, I know you guys are great on getting federal funding, grants, or anything. Would something like the city did last year, their recode, is there some funding out there you might, you know, you're talking $750,000, that's, I know it's a process, but I know you guys will look for that, if it's possible. We will. I don't know. The TPO has had some... Um planning grants recently, but I don't know if this would be applicable, but certainly we will, you know, review any of those options and availabilities. I have a couple of questions. So are we still going to have or be speaking about sector plans? So if the Comprehensive Land Use and Transportation Plan is updated, that will be the plan that would get amended. And so, yes, sector plans would no longer be something that were updated on a regular basis. But the whole idea behind having this one plan is that we update it with more frequency, and then we can focus on smaller areas, which we already do. But, um, you know, looking at corridors, looking at small area, being a little more proactive in our planning. So that segues well into my next question. When you talk about the UDO combining documents, the sector plan then would in fact be, be one of those documents? No, the sector plan is considered a component of the current general plan. All right. So it's a long range plan. All right. But we won't be talking about sector plans anymore. That is correct. Okay. So in under the UDO you made the comment that it's going to combine several documents. What 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 would those documents be that we refer to now? I'll let my colleagues as well jump in. But so the zoning ordinance okay. and then the subdivision regulations, which we utilize to um, divide land. Um, mm -hmm. Jim, do you want to speak about other things you're thinking about including? Yeah, we, we would like to include really everything that touches the development community just for uh, really transparency and uh, convenience. Uh, obviously, we have a building codes, uh, fire codes. Uh, we have stormwater, floodplains, sinkholes. So really anything that, uh, you know, an, an applicant does as it relates to the development of land in Knox County, we would like to incorporate in that, including road standards as well. Okay. And speaking to road standards, um, and I, uh, and I, uh, I appreciate the forward thinking, um, will this in any way help or, or Im impede places where, where the, development got ahead of the roads as far as your your capital plans your I mean how you're going to spend your dollars from year to year it you know Hardin Valley is a good example of that obviously your district where it got <laughs> ahead of it it 
it does add cost to it because obviously the more developed it is around it, the more cost we have for uh, the right-of-way acquisitions and the construction constraints. Uh, but um, so yeah, there will be some additional costs there, but um, uh, we hope to obviously minimize those, you know, especially with some of the studies we're going to do in the get in ribs com or rid of community. So, um, but unfortunately, there will be some additional costs there just because of that us lagging behind in that uh, road improvement. All right, but that doesn't make um, what's already happened go away. I mean, as far as <laughs> getting getting it fixed correct ma'am okay um when when um the discussion comes up about um uh roads and um future development is the udo going to specifically uh, address what will be required of builders with land that touches their development and also will there be any requirement as to development beyond what might specifically touch their property but leads in but is part of a a really crappy road <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, that, that is one of the things that, that we want to do is, is to have a set of roadway standards that better uh, inform the public uh, as well as the developer of what their responsibilities and expectations will be. I know that's one of the things that we talked about on the onset is, you know, uh, the um, making the process more transparent and, and folks being able to, you know, see that the end result and what that looks like because the process is convoluted. So uh, I, my goal would be would be to have standards in place that people, not the development community, as well as the folks that attend the meetings that may have concerns about the surrounding development, that, that they all know what the anticipation of the, the Knox County Government and Highway Department would be. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. J. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Schoonmaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, over the last 15 years, there's been some small area corridor studies and corridor plans initiated where the community was engaged along with county officials and an agreement was made. Under the new directives, if that passes, would those corridor studies that they made an agreement with the community, would those all be negated? No, I don't believe so, Commissioner. So there are a list of plans that have been adopted by this body, and those were, you know, once they are adopted by this body, then they're adopted into the, what was the general plan. And so the thinking is that those, will, those plans that were adopted would be part of this new comprehensive land use transportation plan, and they were taken into consideration. There's a list that's included in the draft plan um, of those, and I can read those off if you like, or I could just send them to, send them to everybody after this meeting. You could. Is there quite a few? Um, there's the East County Community Plan, Alcoa Highway Corridor Study, the French Broad Corridor Study, the Governor John's Severe Highway Corridor Study, the Major Road Plan, the Chapman Highway Corridor Study, the Hardin Valley Mobility Plan. I'm, do I miss any? That's all of them. Yeah. How about ones that go back 15 to 16 to 18 years ago? Is there one specifically that you're thinking there about? There was the Fox Road Corridor was plan. It a, I'd have and to it was adopted. It was adopted, so we can go back and check to make sure that we've not missed any that should okay. be included. Thank you. Commissioner Jay. Did you? No. Commissioner Beeler. I'd like also, while we're waiting on Commissioner Beeler, <clears throat> for the record to reflect all 11 commissioners are present at this meeting. Oh, you're on now. Yes, I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just had a, a quick comment. It, 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 it's, it may be a little premature, but I, I just in Commissioner Schoonmaker's line of, of questions ha, uh, sort of led me to this when he asked about 
how existing densities would be treated. For instance, if something, that something were already zoned at say three per acre, something of that nature. But uh, should this uh, growth policy plan uh, be ratified, I believe I understood it would go into effect May 1st. Was that correct? Did I hear that date? Okay. Um, so yeah, that, that date kind of notwithstanding, I'd, I want to encourage my colleagues to respect its intent prior to that. Because while it may not be quote unquote law before May 1st, it's still long overdue and it's more reflective of what people want and expect than what we have now. So I just, just in case, I, would, I think it was important that we at least consider and respect the intent of, of what this is doing over the next couple months. That's all. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments? Commissioners, if you if you do have other questions, I would encourage you strongly to please contact um, uh, either Amy or Jim, so that when this comes to a vote, that that we're we're clear on exactly what it is we're voting on. Um, staff, I thank you a great deal for um, what you've done. I I echo Commissioner Frazier and and others in in their. Um, realization of the uh, amount of hours that this has taken. And um, I, I, I hope, I, th I think there's light at the end of the tunnel here. And um, I, I appreciate so much the planning for our, our future that's going into this because it's certainly what Knox County has, has needed. So seeing no other lights, we stand adjourned.